You've just finished a set of bicep curls and look in the mirror. Why won't your arms grow? You've been going to this damn gym for years and you still look like a twig. You look across the room. Wait, is that? Hey Kyle, I didn't know you worked out here as well. I noticed that you were insecure about your arms and although they are in fact the smallest I've ever seen, there are actually smaller things out there in the universe. We have things like dust grains, neutrinos, and maybe even quantum foam bubbles. Which reminds me, I have to collide the smallest objects in the universe for today's video. Are you joining me? Great! I knew you had nothing better to do. Let's start by colliding space rocks and pebbles. But don't worry, the rocks and pebbles in this parking lot right here are nothing compared to what we have in space. That's because pebbles and rocks exist on and around asteroids. Mostly. And don't be fooled by their size. Even a pebble or rock the size of your one kilogram dumbbell colliding at a few kilometers per second can completely reshape asteroids and cause a massive chain reaction. That's how teeny tiny asteroids like Bennu or Ryuju exist and spread. They're not fully solid. They're a floating collection of rocks glued by microgravity. But this is where it gets interesting. Humans have actually landed on Ryuju, sampled some of those rocks and brought them back to Earth. What did we find? Organic compounds, Kyle. Yes, those necessary for life, and yes, even water. Would that mean we could potentially live on this asteroid? Well, 99%? Probably not. But if we could, we'd have to figure that out quickly, as the other tiny asteroid Bennu actually has a relatively decent chance, like 1 in 1750, of hitting Earth in the next few centuries. One gives life, and the other could potentially take it. Brutal. And do you know what else Bennu does, Kyle? It's losing parts of itself. Now imagine these same 10 centimeter rocks flying into each other. They would shatter and spread particulates everywhere around. And this doesn't sound too crazy for a collision, but it's exactly what happened in the early solar system, causing the formation of larger and larger rocks over time and eventually leading to planets. And when a planet forms after a collision with another planet, like Earth and Theia, life, which all began thanks to these tiny pebbles carrying the right ingredients. Incredible. However, it's less incredible that this life evolved long enough into you. Apparently, one tiny bump can rearrange an entire solar system. But we can go way smaller than pebbles. Dust grains versus micrometeoroids. Yes, dust grains the size of 1 100th the width of a human hair and micrometeoroids the size of a sand grain or maybe a marble. See, space is absolutely filthy. Every planet, every ring, every orbit is full of tiny grains of some dust. When these two tiny objects collide, it's not some gentle kiss. It's a hypervelocity smash. That impact vaporizes ice, shatters rock, and sprays out a whole cloud of secondary dust. This is why Saturn's rings sparkle. Micrometeoroids are constantly slamming into icy ring particles, blasting out fresh dust that does its part in keeping the rings bright and glittery, but it also darkens them afterwards. Because all these dust grains and micrometeoroid collisions interact with sunlight, we can literally see them from Earth. Yes, the result of these collisions, along with asteroids and comet debris, reveals itself in what we call the zodiacal glow, the magical pyramids of light that you see in beautiful photos of the night. But here's the terrifying part. One grain of dust at orbital speed can punch a hole through a spacecraft. The International Space Station has to use shielding because a single dust speck becomes a space bullet and would penetrate the ship. And I've watched enough Halo movies to know what happens next. Actually, in 2022, NASA confirmed that the James Webb Space Telescope, very pretty, got hit by micrometeoroids. And these tiny invisible grains scarred one of its mirrors. Permanently. <laughs> yes, the dust in space is even more lethal than that from this old gym. They should seriously renew their equipment soon. Anyway. Enough about boring rocks, pebbles, and dust. It's time for molecules versus molecules. Because if we go even smaller and zoom in to see what allows all this dust to exist, and even the planets and stars around us, we get to the gas molecules floating around in giant interstellar clouds. Then a molecule is simply more than one atom of something holding hands with another. At first glance, boring. Just really hot hydrogen, a little helium, and other molecules floating around after being ejected by a dying star stuff called nebula. But things get really interesting when you collide these molecules. Because as they smash into each other like two rhinos on 15 cans of monster, they trade energy. 
Yes, hydrogen versus carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide gets kicked into an excited state, much like a donkey being slapped on its bottom, and then quickly releases that extra energy as light, usually in the form of infrared radiation. You know, heat, like you're a hot stove at home. That infrared radiation escapes the cloud into space, which means the gas as a whole just lost that heat forever. And when you lose heat, you lose pressure. Less pressure means the molecules in the gas cloud stop colliding and being excited. They then cool off and get closer together. And gravity suddenly has the upper hand. As always, gravity then squeezes the cloud tighter and tighter and tighter until boom, you're on your way to forming new stars, if there's enough material. But it doesn't stop there. We found simple organics like alcohols and amino acids inside nebula, which all started from these small collisions. So every star, every planet, and even your pitiful little DNA owes its existence to this process. Yes, that is literally how you are here right now, Kyle. Although that girl over there probably <laughs> wishes differently. You should really stop staring at her every time you come here, creep. Let's look at someone more in your league. I mean, she's over there looking like she could rip you apart right now, actually. Which reminds me, we can also rip apart the stuff that makes up stars, turn them into protons, and of course, collide them. And these protons are even smaller than molecules. But what exactly are protons? Well, protons versus protons is interesting because they are the fundamental particle of the universe. That simply means they are the reason everything you interact with, like gold, silver, lead, and even tin, are all defined by how many protons they have. It is the identity particle of matter. Gold has 79, silver has 47, and hydrogen has one. One proton, Kyle. In inside stars, trillions of them are slamming into each other every second. But here's the catch. All protons are positively charged, which means that they repel each other like two magnets or like you and growing muscle. So how can they collide if they repel each other? Well, that's because of the star's insane gravity. The pressure in the core of a star like our sun forces them together at speeds of hundreds of kilometers per second. A real collision. And yes, the first of three types. The first type of proton collision happens when they get close enough with the absolutely insane temperature in the core, 15 million degrees. They can then overcome that ridiculously strong barrier that forces them to repel each other, and there you have it, fusion. The two protons collide, fuse, and eventually transform into helium, which has two protons, because, you know, the two protons collided. In the process, they spit out particles like positrons, neutrinos, and gamma rays. That's literally the light and heat of the sun, the engine that powers life on Earth. But get this. Every single second, the sun fuses 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium. That's like detonating 100 billion nuclear bombs every second. So while most of the viewers at home struggle to fuse two brain cells together, protons colliding in the sun are keeping them alive lighting their planet, and charging their phone so they can watch this video. Amazing, right? But what if I told you that there's another way to collide protons? One where we aren't just colliding regular protons, but where we are colliding a proton with its evil twin, an anti-proton. And when we collide these two, oh boy, sh** goes down. In fact, it almost caused the end of the universe before it even began. But what the dickens is an anti-proton? I'm so glad you asked. An antiproton is basically a proton's evil twin. Same mass, but negatively charged. When they collide with protons, you know when matter meets antimatter, they don't fuse or bounce. They simply annihilate each other. Gone, poof. Every bit of their mass turns into pure energy, making it nearly 100% efficient, way beyond the sun's fusion. This collision creates bursts of radiation and particle fireworks, which scientists have actually done in particle accelerators. In theory, just a paperclub's worth of antimatter could unleash the energy of Hiroshima. But here's the wild part. The Big Bang made equal amounts of protons and antiprotons at the start of the universe. In theory, they should have wiped each other out with these collisions. The only reason the universe survived was because for every billion annihilations, one lonely proton extra survived. So Kyle, next time you complain that life isn't fair, remember that existence itself is only here because antimatter lost by one in a billion. That is a 0.0000000001 chance. Meanwhile, the chances of you failing every single set at the gym are 100%. But wait, before we go even smaller, 
There is one more proton collision that we have to talk about. One that is so insane, it creates a special substance that shouldn't even be real. See, inside every proton, there are three quarks. And those three quarks are held together by things called gluons. Yes, similar to the glue we all like to sniff back in elementary school. But when you smash protons together at stupidly high energies, those quarks and gluons break free into a special substance. Not a liquid, gas, or solid, but what's called a quark gluon plasma. And I think we should make some by colliding some stuff together to make this really small plasma. This is the stuff the universe was made of in the first microseconds after the Big Bang. A soupy state where quarks and particles called gluons floated around freely. Like the Mongolian horses after Genghis Khan died and they knew they didn't only have to do war stuff anymore and instead could be happy and chase their dreams on open plains with the wind in their hair. Sorry, I got carried away a bit there. I just, I just love my Mongolian horses. But even those horses wanted to know, how do you make this special quark gluon plasma? Well, you silly horses, we do that by colliding heavier elements with many protons, such as gold or lead, at nearly the speed of light. The quarks inside of each proton smash into each other so hard that the forces holding it together break, and everything melts into a plasma hotter than a trillion degrees. That's literally 100,000 times hotter than the core of the sun. For a fraction of a second, it's no longer protons colliding. It's quark vs quark, gluon vs gluon, turning matter back into the primordial soup the universe started with. Wow! But we can go even smaller, neutrinos vs nuclei. These are the particles with a mass so close to zero, we can barely measure it. That's right, non-zero mass is the official definition. They can fly through billions of kilometers of lead without slowing down. They collide with basically nothing. In fact, 100 trillion neutrinos pass through your body every second. Yes, that's a fact too. So many facts today. So where do they come from? In the sun and every star, neutrinos are born during nuclear fusion like we spoke about before. Every time a proton collides with another proton, a fusion happens, a neutrino shoots out at nearly the speed of light. And when a massive star collapses at the end of its life, the core is so much pressure that protons and electrons fuse into neutrons, we call this electron capture, and then release a burst of neutrinos so huge, it carries away 99% of the star's energy in a supernova. But how do neutrinos help power supernovas if they collide with basically nothing? And how could we then collide them with something? Great question, Mongolian horse. In that insane burst of energy from the supernova, a tiny fraction actually collides with the atomic nuclei of the star's outer layers, the dense cores of atoms made of protons and neutrons. Those rare hits help push the shockwave outward, ripping the star apart. That's all it takes. That's how insane neutrino collisions can be, and here on Earth we catch them by filling giant tanks with pure water or ice, and every once in a while a neutrino smacks into an atom and leaves a tiny flash of blue light, which is proof of their existence. And that's basically the smallest we can detect, Kyle. A neutrino. So does that mean the video will end here? Well, no, of course not. Because there are even smaller theoretical objects out there in the universe that we know must exist, but just can't discover yet. That's how damn small they are. And one of those theoretical objects? Axions! You've heard of dark matter, right Kyle? The invisible glue holding galaxies together? Well, one big candidate that explains this phenomenon could be axions. Ultralight particles that could outnumber normal matter by a trillion to one. Now smash two together and boom! They might annihilate into photons. You know, light. This could result in little bursts of X-rays we might actually be able to detect one day, proving its existence. Remember, because it's dark matter, we can't see it. So if we could prove this or solve this collision, it would tell us what most of the universe is made of. Yeah, no big deal actually. Just the most important waiting room in all of humanity. But what if there were objects so small they could create a wormhole by colliding? You heard that right, Kyle. Because here's a question. What exactly allows gravity? What even is it? Wait, what did you say, Mongolian horse? There's a theory out there that exists because of a particle called the graviton? You're right. That horse knows everything. Graviton versus graviton. And the best part is, is that if we smash two of these gravitons together, it could literally warp space-time. No, you wanted big explosions, nah. Try wormholes. Colliding gravitons might tangle space-time so badly, you punch a hole right through it. Yes, a hole in space and time. That's right, Kyle. Gravitons might create shortcuts across the universe. But then what even is space-time actually made of? 
to answer that, we must go even smaller. Quantum foam bubble versus quantum foam bubble. Down at what's called the Planck scale, 10 to the negative 35 meters, that's 0 0.0035. Space-time isn't smooth like your brain. We suppose it's actually a frothing quantum foam. Not like your lonely jacuzzi sessions on your solo trip to Benidorm, no. But the tiny bubbles that flicker in and out of existence every 10 to the negative 43 seconds. Now imagine two of those bubbles colliding. Space-time itself could tear. Not like the gravitons creating wormholes, no, 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 no. But perhaps birthing maybe universes or collapsing everything back into nothing. Oh, that wouldn't be good. But we can go even further. Strings, Kyle, the strings. Because in string theory, everything we've just talked about in this whole video, particles, gas, protons, your non-existent biceps is made of vibrating one-dimensional strings of energy. Collide two strings, you don't just break particles. You rewrite the code of the universe. New dimensions, new physics, new particles that do even more awesome sh and maybe even new laws of reality. If strings are real, then smashing them is like sliming the source code of existence together, even into different dimensions.